It pales in comparison to the indiscriminate killing that's taking place right now. To the people that view others as non-human, as their elected officials have called human animals, right? As they said, if you kill a child, it, you killed a terrorist before he came, became a terrorist. These are quotes. This is not hyperbole. This is not something that I'm putting out there. This is a government with its elected officials spewing that kind of language, and we're sending them billions of dollars in foreign military funds. Welcome, everybody. Um, glad to see so many uh, familiar faces, so many old friends, and so many new faces. Um, I love my friends, but I'm more excited about the new faces, which means that the work of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace is reaching far and, and wide, and I'm completely appreciative of the initiative to bring me here. Uh, when Michael, Dr. Spath, called me and asked if I would come and give a presentation on the situation, I said, you know, there's a whole lot of other people who can speak to this a lot better than I can. You know, they can discuss the situation on the ground, they can show the data, they can show the politics, discuss the situation. I think my mic is dying. Can you still hear me? Okay, okay, sorry. Um, and, and I said, you know, I, there's, there, there are many others. Your list of invitees that you can invite is, is long, so why? You know, why are you interested in me coming and sharing a perspective? And he said, I want a conversation from the heart about a Palestine, about a Palestinian living in the diaspora and, um, you know, just sharing the story and talking about the impact that that has on a Palestinian, again, living in the diaspora and seeing what's going on in Palestine and Gaza in particular. So, as I was trying to think about what to have the, 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 the presentation about. Usually when I write, and by, by no means am I a writer, I'm a pseudo writer, I've maybe written a few columns in the newspaper, I've had you know, a blog here and there. But as, when I think about what to write, I usually, you know, I, I'll fixate on a particular statement or a particular idea or a particular emotion that I don't think people are quite understanding. And I try to elaborate on that and express more. And as I was thinking about tonight's conversation, my mind went to uh, an incident in 2017 while I was still living uh, in Fort Wayne that happened at work. I was at Manchester University uh, here in, in, uh, in the city um, in the uh, leadership position. I was assistant dean at the time of the School of Pharmacy. And 2017, as we all know, is the great year of our benevolent uh, president, Mr. Trump, who, you know, had a couple of years leading to his presidency in which he described people that look like me and come from countries like me in certain terms that are inappropriate to be used in a place of worship, so I will, I will spare you that. And 2017 was also when he introduced the Muslim ban, right? And in that time period le leading up to the Muslim ban and what have you, I've written a couple of columns. I've put out on social media a few things. I put out uh, some posts in, on my blog about that situation. But I'm sitting in my office and I'm pacing. I'm going back and forth thinking, should I broach the subject with my dean or not? And I go and I knock on her door and I, you know, finally after about an hour of tossing the idea. Uh, if you're familiar with the, with the White Stripes song, Seven Nation Army, there's a line back and forth through my mind behind a cigarette, right? I'm going back and forth through my mind behind, I'm sucking on a pen as I'm trying to think of, should I do this or not? And I finally go and I knock on the door. And I say to my dean, I say, you know, I, I really want to talk to you about something. And my dean was someone who was laser focused on work. Like she was, in her own world when she's doing whatever it is that was on the computer screen in front of her, um, which heightened my insecurities and um, imposter syndrome, but that's a whole other talk. But I knock on the door and I'm like, can I come in? And, and she says, sure, come on in. And I sit and I'm like, hey, I want to talk to you about something, you know, um, it's been bothering me for a little while. I, I prefaced, 
I always preface. I, just like I'm prefacing my talk for today with this story, I preface because I can't just jump into a conversation that I feel should be rightfully and easily had without laying the stage, without answering the unanswered questions first to set the stage up so that the person who's listening to what I have to say can understand where I'm coming from. And I said, you know, you know the politics, you know what's going on in the world. I've written articles, I've written blog posts, I've talked about it. I rallied in our, you know, state house in front of the, in front of the um, in downtown. And she's looking at me and she's like, yeah, uh-huh. And she's tapping her foot like Morris coding to me, just get, get on with it. What are, you, what are you trying to tell me? And I said, with all of that, no one at work came and knocked on my door and asked, Ahmed, how are you? And I said, why? And that's when I can almost hear the, the brakes go off in her head. You know, she's like, she stops, takes a second, and she's like, huh. Come to think of it, I never asked you how you are. And I said, yeah, you didn't. I'm like, I'm friends with everybody. You know, we're colleagues. We're similar age, what have you. All the whatever. But no one came and knocked on my door and asked Ahmed, how are you? And she said, yeah, I did come to think of it. And I'm, she's trying to kind of rationalize to herself, not, not in a mean way by any means. She's a, she's a great mentor, great dean and everything. And she said something that, kind of crystallized a lot of the work that I do for me. She said, I guess I never saw you that way. And again, it's not meant in any mean way. I am, I am a very white passing person. If you don't know my name, you don't hear the accent that comes on later at night, I start switching my P's and B's. My kids quickly pick up on that. You know, I'm white passing. I can just keep going. I can call myself Ed. A lot of people, when I say Ahmed, they think I'm introducing myself, saying I'm Ed. Then they call me, hey, Ed. <laughs> I do look like an Ed, I guess. But no one came and asked, how are you? And that, to me, crystallized a lot of what I call the untold stories or humanizing the label. Who is the person behind the label? And hopefully the mic... With, uh, the, uh, here we go. And that's where the I am immigrant was born. My name is Ahmed Mahmoud Rajab Ahmed Abdul Majid. I think there's a Salah in there. Al Asmar. This is how we keep our track of our history the name, the father's name, the grandfather, the great grandfather to the family's name. And I'm a Muslim American immigrant, uh, recovering Canadian. I lived in Canada for about three years. I still apologize to anonymous objects when I run into them. You've, yeah, Tim Holman there from the YMCA understands that. And I've been living in the US, or my journey to the US started in June of 1948. In June of 1948, this is really taking this thing out of it when I can. Here we go. In June of 1948 is when um, the Israeli army came into my hometown of Yibna, Palestine. You can see in, in uh, red Yibna village in the Ramle district. My father was eight years old and my mother was five. And they were both with their families, ethnically cleansed, displaced, moved out of their hometown. Uh, this is not their path, but this is the path of many families that was taken in early 1948. They went down to Gaza for a little while, and then eventually, I don't know if they necessarily were in what's called now Yibna camp, but they were in a camp, refugee camp in Rafah, on the border. And Rafah is where both of my parents were, uh, grew up, and in the early 60s, if I can move the slide, Mikhail, please, thank you, oh, sorry. Uh, in the early 60s, they moved to Qatar, we'll talk about that in a second. But to provide context for what happened to 1948, because it just didn't happen overnight, we have to go over a little bit of history. And I'm not gonna bore you with a lot of historical facts, but we need to establish the stage and context, and I'm sure you're, you're familiar with a lot of this. But we have to talk about the Zionist movement and early Zionism. And early Zionism, you know, in the late 19th century Europe, 
where there was rampant anti-Semitism, there was the Polish philosophers, there was the, you know, many writers, the question of the Jewish questions, what are we going to do with the Jews of Europe? That's what the question was. Extremely intolerable conditions for uh, the Jewish communities in Europe. And then combine that with what was called a national ferment, like every place wanted to be their own national state, and, you know, and, and a country. And that inspired people to demand their own nation states. And when the, the politically correct term, major European territorial acquisitions in Asia and Africa, actually meaning colonial land and colonialism across the, the lands, that you can potentially move people in and, and, and um, divide as you wish. Next slide, please. And real quickly, in the late 1800s, 1896, uh, Theodor Herzl, who's an Austro-Hungarian Austro Jewish journalist and writer, published, uh, I'm going to butcher this, the pronunciation of that, uh, Der Jodenstadt, advocating establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine or elsewhere. Palestine wasn't necessarily the only choice. There were some in South, uh, South America and other places that were considered. In 1896, the Jewish Colonization Association, which was founded in 1891, uh, starts aiding Zionist settlements in Palestine. 1897, we have the first Zionist Congress in Switzerland, and we have the home for the Jewish people in Palestine. I'm skipping over a lot. I'm just trying to highlight some milestones in the history leading up to the Nakba or the occupation of 1948. 1904 to 1914, over that decade, we saw a wave of about 40,000 Zionist immigrants, Jewish immigrants, increasing the Jewish population in Palestine to about 6% of the total indigenous population. Palestine had about 4% Jewish population or Jewish Arabs, Jewish Palestinian within uh, the state. Next slide, please. And if we jump to May 1916, we've heard of the Sykes-Pico, which is British and French, uh, who were trying to figure out, once they realized the Ottoman Empire is falling, once they realized that there's a pie to cut up, they wanted to see which slice of the pie which colonial power gets. And so Sykes-Pico, uh, and there was a, uh, I believe, Russian in there as well, but didn't become as prominent. They had a convention during World War I in which Britain and France, uh, with the ascent of Imperial Russia, for the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire, they agreed to the division of the Turkish-held Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Palestine into various British, French, administered areas. And you can see that in the red, Palestine fell under the British mandate. Right? So the, the British controlled the Palestine area during that time, and then the other uh, states or parts of the geography were split between uh, the other superpowers. Next slide, please. And then we come to 1917 on the 2nd of November with a gentleman by the name of Balfour, Arthur Balfour, who you, you've heard the ter term Balfour Declaration. But I don't know if all of us have read the declaration. This is the entirety of the declaration. I'm going to read it to you, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. So in his declaration, he addresses Do dear Lord Rothschild, who is representative of the World Zionist Organization. And he says... I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of our sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this, ob uh, of this object or objective. It being clearly understood, because he's being a nice guy here, that nothing shall be done with, which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation, Sir Arthur James Balfour. This is textbook speak when we talk about colonialism. And if you read the book, The Hundred Year War by uh, uh, Rashid Khalidi, he talks about this and breaks it down a little bit, and I'm going to share some of his insight with you. First, I mean, notice that within that, he recognizes that land as Palestine twice, right? And then he says, 
which may, uh, nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights. Political rights are not, mean, uh, not mentioned here. Civil and religious rights, not political rights, of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. 1917, we just learned a couple of slides ago, the Jewish population in Palestine was at approximately 6 to 7 percent. He refers to 93 percent of the population by negation, right? So the existing non-Jewish population, which is 94 percent, 93 percent of the population, completely brushes aside by his declaration, nothing within their non-Jewish communities in Palestine. What's even more interesting, as, I, you know, as I'm learning more and more about this, if we can move to the next slide, please, is during that time, um, here we go, during that time, there was a gentleman by the name of Edwin Montague. He was the only Jewish member of parliament in England. And he opposed England and the World Zionist Organization's aspirations of establishing of a Jewish state in Palestine. He writes this, he has a, a whole long uh, memorandum on this that you can f find if you uh, look for the Jewish Virtual Library and look for his name, you'll find it there, the whole declaration. But his concern, and I'll, I'll highlight a couple of his, his saying, he says, Zionism has always seemed to me to be a mischievous political creed untenable by any patriotic citizen of the United Kingdom. I have always understood that those who indulged in this creed were largely animated by the restrictions upon and refusal of liberty to Jews in Russia. So he understands where it's coming from. But at the very time when these Jews have been acknowledged as Jewish Russians and given all liberties, it seems to be inconceivable that Zionism should be officially recognized by the British government and that Mr. Balfour should be authorized to say that Palestine was to be reconstituted as the national home of the Jewish people. And with his memorandum, what he's talking about basically is that we have advanced over the years to be recognized as citizens of those countries, of Russia of, you know, and, and the others. And this will do us a disadvantage because all of a sudden we're in just one location as opposed to being you know, Jewish American, Christian American, Muslim American. Right? So he vehemently, actually, if you read the whole thing, opposed that. But Balfour Declaration gave the green light for the establishment of the State of Israel. Next slide, please. Yibna, my town of Palestine. And if you go to the website palestineremembered.com, Palestine remembered all one word, you'll see the uh, the, the census there and the land ownership per dunums, I don't really uh, know how dunums translate to acres, but you can see the overwhelming majority of the ownership uh, in Arab, Jewish, and public, and then what, how the land was used and what the population was from 1948 and then at the latest estimate, refugees in 1998. But 1948, there was about 6,300 people living in Yibna, Palestine. Next slide, please. So that Nakba, or the catastrophe that the Palestinians referred to in 1948, the impact of that when, and I, and I skipped a lot of history, and part of that history that you wanna you know, look up when you get home or if you have read about, read about again, is understanding how the World Zionist Organization with some of the land acquisition and some of the mass migration primarily from Eastern Europe and the money that was funneled into purchasing arms. They signed a, a deal with Czechoslovakia worth 12 point some million dollars at the time and had rounds of ammunition that to face uh, an indigenous population that was citizens or civilians and farmers that didn't carry arms for the most part, didn't have an army. And there was the Haganah, if you want to read about it, it was a paramilitary that eventually trained with England and became the military and so on and so forth. And we find in ourselves in 1948 and in 19, by 1949, 750,000 Palestinians in total were forcibly expelled or fled outside of their homeland, my parents included. And, and, and I just want that to sink in for a minute because a lot of times when the discussions around this happen, 
it's viewed as if this is ancient history. This is like so long ago. My father, who passed away three years ago, lived through that. My mother, who, left, who passed away a year after him, she lived through that. I'm not talking about generations removed. I am the first in my family, in the generation of my family, from both sides, to be born outside of Palestine. Zionist forces had committed about 223 atrocities by that time, massacres, attacked, uh, bombings of homes, looting, destruction of property, entire villages. And then within that, some 150,000 Palestinians remained in the areas of Palestine that became parts of the Israeli state. And when you look at you know, uh, the, uh, the, the map, of those 150, some 30 to 40 were internally displaced. So they were moved from their town to another town, but they still lived within what's, uh, what became Israel. And so they're referred to as Arab Israel, or the Arabs of Israel, okay? Internally displaced. And Israel prohibited displaced Palestinians from returning to their homes. And you can see that by 1949, the West Bank was under Jordanian occupation, Gaza, was Egyptian occupation, and then the armistice lines, the dashed lines in between, those are the lines with the other countries that are saying, okay, we don't recognize you, you don't recognize us, but we're gonna recognize the, uh, that we're not going to fight each other. Okay, that's what basically armistice lines mean. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm gonna skip ahead to 1967. A lot more has happened between them, but then the Nakba was followed by the Nexa. So the Nakba was the catastrophe, the Nexa was the um, how to say it in English? The, uh, the, the, um, it'll come to me. It's basically uh, falling back or, or uh, missed up or falling, falling back again. So, Nexa of 1967 uh, was the, uh, another term for it was the Six Day War. It was the Israel caught wind of Egypt wanting uh, an, an Arab army to try and have a, uh, have a war with Israel. And within six days, Israel decimated that entire, they, they attacked the planes before they even left the ground. Very successful military campaign by Israel at that time. And in 1967, you'll see that the land occupied by Israel now is in beige, moved to, they occupied the West Bank, Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, Gaza, and the Sinai. Expanded over that. And in 1979, Egypt became the first Arab country to recognize Israel, and Israel withdrew all its forces in return, returned Sinai, basically, and settlers from there. Uh, they completed in 1982, and that left Israel in occupation of the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. In 1994, Jordan became the second Arab state to recognize the state of Israel, and then, you know, before that, the Oslo Agreement, and, you know, all the things that we've talked about, or that you know about. Next slide, please. Where that left my parents, who, again, were eight and five years old when they were forced out of their homes with their, um, with their families, in Rafah on the Egyptian border, was with a Wafiqit Safar lil in Palestinian, which is a refugee travel document for Palestinians issued by Egypt, okay? With that, it's just a form of identification. My parents moved to Qatar. I think before the 1967 war, they were in the late 50s, early 60s. My, my father's older brother had moved to Qatar, established himself, brought my father, and then the rest of the family, and pretty much the entirety of my family, like cousins, uncles, whatever, live in Qatar and the United Arab, Arab uh, Emirates. Next slide, please. The refugee travel document, to understand the power of that document, I'll read you what it says on the front cover of it in Arabic and I'll translate. It says, for those who understand Arabic, This document is of great importance. Okay? And we, you must take absolute care that this does not fall in the hands of someone who does not have the right to possess it. It's, I mean, powerful, right? It's like a document. Yes. Blah, blah, blah. If you lose it, if it's damaged, go to the nearest 
um, uh, council and talk to the ne nearest ambassador and get it all situated. And then the line that, you know, just makes you so proud to have that document, it says, وَتَصْلُحْ هَذِهِ الْوَثِيقَ لِلسَّفَرْ إِلَى الْبِلَادِ الْمُدَوَّنَا بِهَا دُونَ غَيْرِهَا And this travel document allows its owner, its holder, to travel to these countries that are listed within it, but nothing else. كما أنها لا تخول حاملها دخول جمهورية مصر العربية أو المرور منها إلا إذا حصل على تأشيرة دخول أو مرور أو تأشيرة عودة. And this document does not allow its holder to enter Egypt or pass through Egypt without a visa. The country that issued the travel document does not allow its holder, its owner, to enter Egypt without a prior visa. Can't even transit through Egypt without a prior visa. And uh, no other document will be issued, blah, 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 unless, whatever. Next slide, please. So for my parents, and for us growing up in Qatar, it was fully understood early on that our way to having some sort of a normal life was through education. The gentleman in the picture with chubby 11-year-old me was Mr. Sabir Jabir. He was my English, fifth grade English teacher. He literally taught me my ABC, right? Mr. Sabir Jabir taught me the basics of English. My parents, with a high school education each, fully understood that you had to master the English language in order to go somewhere where you can get educated and hope that that education will get you landed immigrant status, a citizenship somewhere where you can have a decent living. Because living on a refugee travel document in Qatar meant that we were all on the mercy of my father's employer. My father and my mother both worked. My mother was a teacher. My father was a, a salesperson for automotive sports, uh, automotive spare parts company. But my father was considered the breadwinner of the house. If my father lost his job, he needed to find another sponsor within about a month, otherwise the entire family gets deported. You have to find another place to live. Now, I don't want you to also misunderstand me. I, we did live a pretty much what you would call middle class life. Uh, although we were refugees, you know, it wasn't tense. We never struggled to have food on the table. My parents made sure of that but we did not have any rights of a citizen. Yes, I did get a free public education. I, get, I got free public health. That's changed more recently over the past 10, 15 years. But my father couldn't own his own house. It had to be in the name of a Qatari citizen. My father couldn't own his own business. It had to be in the name of a Qatari citizen. I couldn't, as a 12, 13-year-old, I fully understood that one, Education is a path forward. And two, I can't get in a stupid fight with a Qatari citizen because they might drag my whole family through the mud. So that's what we grew up with in Qatar. And that's what pushed my father. I'm the youngest of five, two girls, two boys. And my father pushed all of us to get higher education. He wanted each one of us to become dentists. He did his homework. And he's like, dentist, you'll make good money. You can find a job anywhere. You can build your own business. Only one of us became a dentist. The rest were like, eh, no, not for me. I'm not looking into people's mouths all day long. Next slide, please. So I obviously have a vested personal interest in the story of Palestine. It impacts me directly. It impacted my parents. It impacts my family all over the world and those in Palestine. By what, why should you care, right? What's, why are we having this conversation? Why are we learning a little more? Next slide, please. Why we should care? Because our government, the United States, has given the state of Israel the largest foreign assistance since World War II. $300 billion to date, and that date was January 2024. That doesn't include, I think, the $16 billion that we just authorized in the last couple of weeks. The United States annually gives $3.8 billion in foreign military funds to Israel. 
That's our tax money. So we have a vested in interest as citizens of this country to ask questions about how, that, how those funds are being used and what damage is this doing to us and to our allies. We've used veto power. As of May of 2022, the US has used its veto power 82 times. There are a couple of different numbers floating out there, but 82 seems to be the, the right one. And the, since 1972, the US has cast a veto in the UN Security Council against anti-Israel resolutions or condemnations of Israel 46 times. So if we're allies and if we are friends, we need to hold our allies and friends that is the state of Israel, accountable. We definitely have a vested interest in them, right? Next slide, please. And if we don't care about, about it as American citizens, we should care about it as human beings. And I'm going to share a couple of slides that probably are not that shocking to you. But since 1967, that war we talked about, and you know, the, the two states solution or whatever, uh, after 50 years, there was a, a, a report published by Amnesty International, and in that report, so this was in 2017, they have accounted 600,000 plus Jewish Israeli settlers living on occupied Palestinian land in, in the West Bank and Gaza. 100,000 plus hectares of land appropriated by Israel from Palestinians since 1967. So the expansionist nature of the state did not stop at in 1967. 50,000 homes and structures demolished by Israel in the occupied Palestinian territories over the past 50 years from 1967 to 2017. And 4.9 million Palestinians face daily restrictions on their movement. In the 50 years since 1967. So when I refer to the state of Israel as a colonialist, expansionist, apartheid regime, this is one of the reasons why. Next slide, please. More recently, as we all know, the retaliation to the attacks of October 7th, where over 1,200 Israelis were killed and 5,400 injured, we see the death toll, and this is as of yesterday, 35,000 Palestinians killed, 79,000 reported injured. And I know you've heard, probably heard, the UN adjusted the numbers and it's really 22 or whatever. The clarification that they came out with, and if you read the next line of it, is that the documented identified people, the rest are still documented but not fully identified. And they say our track record with the uh, health organization is that they are usually very accurate with their numbers. But there's another piece to that that kind of gets under my skin is that, okay, so 34,000 is ah, cringeworthy, but 24,000, no, no, no. They, they only killed 24. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's just that sense of, really? Next slide, please. And to Put Gaza in perspective. This is Gaza on the left-hand side. It's a population of 2.1 million people living in that strip in an area of 365 kilometers, a little over 200 miles, square mile. Allen County has a total area of 660 square miles. So Gaza is about a third of Allen County. The population of Allen County is 385,000 people. Fifth of the number of people that live in Gaza. So you have five, as, five times as many people living in a third of the space that we have in Allen County alone. Okay? Now that space, since October 7th and from the northern end, is when they kept saying, go down south, go down south, go down south. And now when you look at area number five, Rafah, that's where all two million people are right now. There is no such a thing as a smart bomb. Right? When you have that much of a concentration of human beings. Actually, I'll take it back. There is a smart bomb because Israel did kill 
a Lebanon military or a military leader in Lebanon on the second floor of an apartment building in a busy strip and they only killed him and damaged that floor so they have the capability of, of smart quote-unquote bombing but this is indiscriminate bombing that's happening and now they put them all in Rafah two million people in that small little strip back there next slide please so with all of this going on in the past 76 years in the past eight months in particular the most difficult question as a Palestinian to answer is the question of how are you? The question that I craved people to ask me in 2017, I'm right now, I, I don't know how to answer that question. It's a very difficult question to answer. But I try and categorize it as I explain it to people into three different categories. There's the personal, there's the professional, and then there's the existential. Next slide, please. On the personal level, on that website again, palestinerememberd.com, Yibna today, according to a Palestinian historian, Walid Khalidi, all that remains of the village of Yibna, a railroad crosses the village, the dilapidated mosque and minaret together with a shrine still remain. At least two of the remaining houses are used by Jewish families and one by an Arab family. One of the houses occupied is made of concrete from its flat roof rise an electricity post and a TV antenna. Next slide, please. That's the house in the top right corner. This is a picture from the 1970s. And then that's the house at the bottom, a little closer, uh, a more, a more um, recent picture of the house. And that's my grandfather, who died, who died in Rafah. Um, 10 or 11 years ago, and that's his house. But there's more to it. It's not just about material stuff. It's not just about the land. It's not just about the home. It's about the fact that there are so many broken parts of my own history that I don't know because of this. Last time I saw my grandfather, I was 11 years old. 35 years ago, because for him to cross into Egypt with my grandmother, for them to see us, we used to meet in Egypt, had become at that point too much for him. He died at 90 some years old. It was a gruesome, or it was a, it was a grueling trip for him to take to come see us. So the last time I saw him, I was 11 years old, and my grandmother. He's buried in Rafah. I don't know if his grave is still. Next slide, please. But then there's the other parts that I don't understand and I'm learning more and more now, such as the house that I mentioned is the house that my mother was born in, but it wasn't my grandfather's house. It was my grandmother's house because her dad built it. My, my mother's father, my mother's grandfather built that house I always understood it as my grandfather's house, but then I learned, as I'm talking to my oldest sister, she's 14 years older than me. So, the, so my, my siblings are 14, 12, 10, and 6 years older than me. So they lovingly call me the oops. And I tell them, no, they kept trying till they finally got it right. But my oldest sister, who's now become kind of the family, the immediate family's historian a little bit, she said, no. This is grandma's house. Her dad, and, her dad and her mom had had a few miscarriages before her. And so when she was born, they, we called her, they called her Limdellele, the, the, the spoiled one. She wouldn't go on the fields. He wouldn't let her work. She's just to stay home. My grandfather lost his father when he was, so her husband lost his father when he was three weeks old, before the occupation, whatever. And he was a distant relative of her father, so he grew up in that house. And so they both grew up in the house, ended up getting married, and my mother was born in that house that still stands in Palestine today. And then my oldest sister drops this on me as I'm asking her more and more questions. 
She said, yeah, I've been to the house. <laughs> I'm like, what? She said, yeah, in the 70s, she was maybe 12. Um, and the restrictions weren't as bad as they are now, but they were still bad. And they took a chance and rode in a cab, her a couple of aunts and my grandfather, and they went to the house and they knocked on the door and it was a Yemeni Jewish family. And they said, sure, go ahead, take a look at the house. And so they went through the rooms and I can't remember if it's like my, my uh, mother or her mother, they were pointing the rooms and who lived in what room. And my grandfather couldn't get himself to step into the house. He stayed outside. And when time for prayer came, he prayed on the steps of the door. He didn't go inside. He couldn't, he couldn't handle it. Next, please. This is my cousin's house in Gaza that was just bombed recently. Or apartment building. So most of my family left Rafah. You know, from 1948 to Rafah, most of them left. Most of them established themselves elsewhere. She was born and raised in Qatar as well. She's older than me, but she got married and went with her husband and been in Gaza for the last 30 years. And then I get a message through Facebook Messenger from her son saying, can you help us with this GoFundMe? We're trying to get 10 members of the family outside and some, um, I'll call them decent, Egyptians on the borders are making bank charging 5000 to $10,000 per person to get them across the border that now CC in Egypt open to Israel anyways. But 10 members of the family, uh, her husband, his dad, uh, two one-year-olds from uh, cousins, because you lose members of the family. The stories that we hear, you know, is that the families don't travel together. They spread out. Because if one gets killed or bombed, there are others that can continue the family. I, a friend in, in, um, in uh, Connecticut, where I'm at now, uh, he's, he's lost, I, I don't know, 15, 20 members of his family. And it's all like my sister's husband and the firstborn, but she's there with the second and third born because they're splitting up to try and survive somehow. Next slide, please. So it hits you on the familiar level, and then it hits you on the personal level, or the, the friend's level. This is Dr. Ammar Ghanem that Terry mentioned early on. He's no stranger to ICMEP. He's spoken a couple of times during the Syrian uh, uh, civil war. Uh, we held fundraisers for medical equipment. He's an intensivist pulmonologist uh, in Detroit now. He moved a few years ago. This was two weeks ago in the hospital with a team through SAMS, Syrian American Medical Society. And this is a text exchange that I had with him from a couple of days ago. I said, are you still in Gaza or are you, were you able to leave? And he said, no, not really. We're still waiting on the World Health Organizations and it's day by day. I texted him today. And I said, any news? And he said, and I'll play. I'll, I'll play it to you and I'll translate it. It's Arabic, Arabic English, but I'll translate it. It's just less than a minute. Nothing new, we're waiting on the WHO. Our mission ended last Monday. So they've been there now for over a week. And it's day by day. They haven't let us out or haven't let anyone in. He said, in the next two hours, we'll, we'll, reach, we'll receive today's decision. And inshallah, God willing, they will let us, uh, let us go. But, but listen to the next segment. We want a new mission waiting in Cairo to come in. So he says, and this is like, this is the person that needs to be here speaking to you, not me. These are the heroes, right? He says, but I hope, so he's, I'm asking about himself. You know, his, his wife and three kids are in Detroit. 
And he says, but I hope that they let the other mission come through from Egypt because the people there, when they see us, they have a little bit of hope that there is some safety because the foreigners, you know, bring that sense of security a little bit more with them. So he's focusing on next. Like he's, he's not worried just about himself. He's like, I'll make it out, inshallah, God willing. But really what I'm hoping for is that the other mission will come through. Uh, people start to worry when they don't see this. Uh, did you hear the explosion? I mean, this is around us, uh, close by. Yalla, inshallah, now. Did you catch the last part? He said, did you hear the explosion? I, I don't quite, I didn't quite make the explosion. He's like, this is just nearby. This, this is from today, right? These are American doctors in a country that we call our ally who are trying to protect the most vulnerable and we can't even get them back to safety. Next slide, please. There's the professional, how are you? This was a, uh, an article in the uh, Chronicles of Education that came out in November and said scholars who study the Middle East are afraid to speak out. Polling data indicate widespread self-censorship. Among the academics that study these issues, they're self-censoring. Why is that? Because another friend of mine at IU, full tenured, got suspended on, riddle me this, on a paper mistake reserving a room where Miko Pellet, that we've held here, who's an Israeli-American who speaks about the situation, they brought him over and they said, you did not have authorization to get him in the room. You're suspended for the next six months. A full, he's tenured, I don't know if he's associate or full professor, at Indiana University. The same university that had a sniper on the roof two, three weeks ago for the students, you know, uh, protesting in the encampment. The amount of censorship that's happening, the amount of discussions and conversations we have in whispers about this, the fact that in all of these talks, I say don't use my professional title. My university has been great. Sisters of Mercy, Catholic oriented, very peace oriented, but still, don't be misconstrued by using your title as speaking on behalf of the university for me to speak about my experience and who I am. Fine, I don't use it. I'm not self-censoring. They're not asking me to self-censor, but just don't use your title. I am the only Arab dean of pharmacy in the United States. Next slide, please. In April, Arab National Heritage Month, a big law firm in New York, I'm in Connecticut now, they for six weeks said we would like you to come to do a virtual speak. We, each month we do a DEI series, divers, uh, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. In honor of Arab Heritage Month, we would like you to speak. I was recommended to them by a consultant. I said okay. I can speak about one, two, three, four. I can speak about the intersectionalities of my identity. I can speak about being a Muslim, uh, doing you know, training for Islam and caring for the Muslim patient with academics and healthcare professionals. I can talk about this. I can talk about being a Palestinian X, Y, and Z. We love the Palestinian idea. Can you talk to us about that? I said, okay. Six weeks in the making. I said, okay, here, I will you know, have this slide for you and we'll call it Palestine through the eyes of the displaced, current and historical context. That's the title. Uh, there was a, a piece of paper that I didn't sign that would allow them to use my image and my name to advertise the event. They caught it and they're like, hey, it's, your event is next week. We haven't really done much with it. We usually do it anyways within a week. Can you sign this and send it back to us? I signed, I sent it back. Friday, there's a couple of posts on LinkedIn with my picture and my name. LinkedIn is my platform primarily. And Monday morning, 
I get an email from the chief diversity officer of the entire firm. Oh, it gets better. And he says to me, can we talk? People have raised concerns. Friday evening, Friday, 3.30 PM, I remember, I saw the first post with me tagged. And LinkedIn, for those who are not familiar with it, is like professional platform. You know, usually you wouldn't really go on it on the weekend. So at the very end of the week, Monday I get the email, we need to talk, people are, have expressed concerns about the title of your talk. So I read between the lines and I replied, I said, I will, if you'd like, we can get on a team Zoom and I will go through the slides, slide by slide for you. But I will not shy away from using terms as apartheid, as colonialism, as expansionism, when I describe Israel and Israeli policies because I am able, as any intelligent person is able, to discern actions of a government and laws and whatever from human beings and from a religion. I'm not conflating. I'm not, so I, I just laid it out to him. I said, you want? I'll go over it with you. You don't want? Cancel my talk. No harm, no foul. Tuesday morning, I get a managing partner of the firm saying, we advise you that your talk will not be held tomorrow. Thank you. I replied to them, okay, I pray for clarity of conscience and mind for you. I got canceled on that. I got canceled from a high school because, you know, I'm too risky because I'm Palestinian. I just got a text from a friend of mine who's in academia who is a DAI queen. And after three or four months with another university, she got canceled because of her affiliations, because they don't know about her neutrality when discussing the situation. Next slide, please. And then there's my favorite, the existential. Chat GPT, 3.5. Do Israelis have the right to self-determination? I asked it that question. It said, yes, Israelis have the right to self-determination, just like any other people. Israelis have the right to freely determine their political status, pursue their economic, social, and cultural development, and live in peace and security within recognized boundaries. Beautiful answer. Do the Palestinians have the right to self-determination? Well, the question of Palestinian self-determination is a complex and has been a subject of international debate and diplomatic efforts for decades. The right to self-determination is a fundamental principle enshrined in international law, including the United Nations Charter and the International uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This right recognizes the ability of people to freely determine their political status and pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. I don't know, ChatGPT 4.0 just came out yesterday. I don't know if they corrected it. I highly doubt it. But this is where your future researchers and scholars Accounting on. You know, this is the, in, in terms of going from the abacus to the calculator, this is what, what AI is introducing. Right? And according to AI, I don't exist. Actually, according to some people here, when we hosted Miko Pellet a few years ago at the Allen County Public Library, again, a Israeli, who I think no longer is allowed to enter Israel, uh, American Jewish person who's, I think, grandfather was one of the signers of the Declaration of the State of Israel, was here at the Allen County Public Library speaking about the violations of human, uh, international laws and human rights by the Israeli government. And we were there, and someone in the audience stands up and says, well, there is no such a thing as Palestine. There's no such a thing as Palestinian. Two rows down from me, six, seven years ago. Right? Next slide, please. But all of that, all of that pales in comparison to what's happening right now. I don't give a shit if I get fired. Excuse my language. I don't care if whatever happens to me, it pales in comparison to the indiscriminate killing that's taking place right now. To the people that view others as non-human, as their elected officials have called human animals, right? 
As they said, if you kill a child, it, you kill the terrorist before he came, became a terrorist. These are quotes. This is not hyperbole. This is not something that I'm putting out there. This is a government with its elected officials spewing that kind of language and we're sending them billions of dollars in foreign military fund. This is what matters. Not the inconveniences that I have here or that I may have here. <laughs>